Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another Case for the Old Testament class. Um, thank you for joining us week after week. If you've been following along, I really appreciate you sticking with it. Um, you know, doing the doing the study the Bible thing is really tough and it's a commitment. And so what I really encourage is that, you know, if you pray about it, you ask the Holy Spirit to be your guide and the one who is, is leading you, um, that you pray about protection because I could almost guarantee that every time you go to study, things pop up. You know, the phone rings and someone's at the door or the kids have problems or things happen and whatever it might be. Um, you have to really be intentional about it and pray for protection so that you can, you know, do it on a regular basis. So if you're doing this individually, that's great. Um, I encourage you to try to do it in a small group. That's the best way to do it. Um, and, you know, if you're in our in-person class and you're just playing catch up or you, or you missed a class or two, or you're looking back and reviewing, that's, that's great too. So that's the purpose of this online um, presentation. And so what we're doing um, at this point is we're about halfway through the book of Genesis and we've spent a lot of time on it. And we had a case for Genesis class, which was basically Genesis one through 11. We started a case for the Old Testament, which was a look at Abraham and the beginning of his life and the all important covenant that God established with him. And now we're moving into the lives of people like Isaac, Abraham's son, and his son, Jacob, and on down the line as we move in and through the history. So we're calling this part of our class, The History Continues. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to try to get through the rest of the book of Genesis without rushing and making sure we really understand what's going on here, why it's important to know this history, and how it relates to us as Christians today. I think that's really, really critical. So um, I hope you stay with us and join us. And uh, and if you have questions or concerns, go to the website if you're not watching it there and, and put it in the comment section. I would love to get feedback uh, from people on you know, what you're learning or if there's things that you, you'd like to see presented that we, we haven't talked about, you know, please do that as well. If you have comments, things to add to the presentations, that's always welcomed as well. And so before we get started, I want to go ahead and open us in prayer and we'll get into tonight's lesson. Father, thank you for, thank you for all that you do for us each and every day. You make so many things possible. There's so many things that we tend to take for granted and we don't stop and thank you for it because we know that you're the one that is walking beside us, helping us, guiding us, um, directing our path and giving us opportunities to share with others. And so we pray for your protection. We pray for your uh, passion because we want to learn, we want to be excited and we want to share with others. And we think that um, as Christians, sometimes it's difficult, but we ask for your guidance and protection on that. So Holy Spirit, be the one that works in and through us and teaches us in all things that we do. Uh, Jesus, we thank you for what you've done to make it possible for us to have that eternal home that we look forward to. And so for tonight's class, we thank you. We give you all of the honor and we ask you to bless us, help us to learn something we've never learned before. And we thank you for that. And we pray always in Jesus name. Amen. All right. I don't know about you guys, but I, I do always seem to learn something new. Um, and I think the more that you go through the Bible, you know, over and over, the more things you pick up on and you go like, hey, I never knew that was there before. And you see things and you make connections. And one of those biggest things that I've been learning more than anything is, you know, looking at the person of Jesus. And so um, I hope that you see those foreshadowings, those pictures, those pointing towards, you know, the coming of the Messiah throughout our Old Testament study, because it is all over the place. And so for tonight, um, as we jump into this, this lesson, we, 
again, are doing a few different things during the class. We start out with a review, and then we're going to look at the Bible study from last week, and then we're going to continue with a little bit of an apologetics presentation, which is a big part of why we do these classes, so that you can feel confident in that what you believe to be true in Christianity is really true. And there's a lot of evidence out there for it. And just sometimes it just takes some thinking through some things and common sense to, to kind of weed out the misconceptions and the errors that are presented in our culture today. And I think that's really important as Christians that we are able to do that. And so we'll talk a little more. We started um, last week on this topic of kind of looking at across the board and, you know, looking at Judaism, Islam, Christianity, and this thing called religious pluralism. And really kind of looking at the question, aren't all religions the same? And don't they all lead to God? You know, that seems to be a, a, a thought in our culture today. And is that true? And if it if if you say yes, that's true, that's that's religious pluralism. And that's what we're going to take a look at. Does it make sense logically? Is it true? And if it's not, what are some of the differences that are out there? And how can we come to know that Christianity is true? And so that's kind of a like little overview of what we're going to do with that part. All right. Well, before we get started, it's important that, again, if you're in a group or even on your own, hit pause, um, spend a little time on, on some prayer with each other if you're in a group. Um, and then last week, we started this memorizing some helpful facts about the Bible. Because, again, I think just having the basics as a Christian understanding, you know, the foundation of the Bible what is the Old Testament? Why are there categories? What are those categories? What books are in those categories? What's going on? And this helps give us that big picture understanding, which I think is really critical before you dive in deep to the Old Testament or the Bible itself in general, is understanding how these things all connect, the big overarching picture, and that scarlet thread that runs through the Old Testament, really important. So what are the five categories of Old Testament books in the Christian Bible and the 39 books in each of those categories? There's a hint there. It's five in the first category. Twelve books are in that second category. Then five in the third, five in the fourth, and 12 in the last category. That can help you kind of break that down as you're practicing memorizing. Um, we went over those last week. And, um, you know, you can look in your Bible, you know, you don't, you can, you can cheat. It's okay. Cheat a little bit. But the point is to try to get to where you don't have to look at the Bible and don't have to do that. And you can have it all memorized. So that's your goal. And then B, what are the major historical events, the major players involved in those events and the major covenants found in Genesis? Um, I'll help you with that in a few minutes. We did go over it last week. Um, but go ahead and, and hit pause. Don't forget to read through your memory verse as well. And then come on back. All right. So if you did that, you paused, you practiced a little bit, you came on back. Um, I have a, a little handout I want to share on the on 2B, major historical events, players, and covenants. So let me see if I can bring that up. I got to stop share. And then I always have a little trouble with this. So Give me uh, just a second here. All right, I think it's this one. Yeah, okay, here it is. And then if I focus in on that a little bit, um, no, this is the books of the Bible. All right, so this one, okay, I'll leave this up for a second if you want to, um, if you want to use that for a minute and take a picture. These are the books um, and their categories. And the 39 books of the Old Testament. You know what? It says I'm paused here. Let me hmm. let me try a minute again here. Hmm. See if I can get this one up here now. There it is. Okay, now it says I'm sharing that. All right, I'm sorry. So I don't know if it showed or not. I'll have to check it. But I had a I had a page that had the books of the Bible. But again, you can look at those in in your actual Bible. This one, though, you're not going to find as easily on a chart form. So this is the one I wanted to share with you that'll help you practice um, to be 
And this is the major historical events, people, and covenants of the Bible. And just to focus only on Genesis, that's what I wanted to do here. So what we've covered so far in our classes, starting from the beginning, is, and, and I've got a category with dates. Some people like timelines, and this will help keep things in order. Don't get too hung up on the dating there as if you, you know, wanted to, hey, you know, the, the earth is, what is it they have now, 6.5 billion years old and, you know, and that can't be the right, I, I don't want you to get hung up on that. This is the biblical dating. If we took the genealogies of the Bible and we started um, and went, you know, from the genealogies backwards and we go to God's creation with Adam, then we're looking at about 4,000 BC, give or take, okay? Um, you know, some young earth creationists go anywhere from 4,000 to 10,000 BC. That's not the issue right now. If you want to see how I laid that out, you can go back to the case for the Genesis class and we talk all about, you know, the debate there on the dating and stuff. But we're going to stick with the conservative biblical um, dating that's there in the Bible. And I think we can have some confidence in that, especially moving forward when we look at dates for other things. And again, I know some people want to argue the dates. Don't get hung up on things that are not the main thing. The main thing is Jesus. And so we're looking at how God laid out that big picture. And I actually love talking about young earth, old earth, you know, all of the debates between evolution, creation, and all of that stuff. Um, so please go back and look at a uh, case for Genesis. But for the sake of our timeline here, we're going to definitely stick to biblical dating. So, all right. So we've got in the beginning, we've got creation. Again, we're looking at major historical events, players, and covenants. So how they line up. So you have creation. And of course, the most important player would be God himself. Um, and so you find the books of Genesis chapters one and two, and then the fall um, would be the next major historical event. And I've bolded and starred um, the major historical players that are a direct lineage to Jesus. And I think that's who we really want to focus on. Although I threw in a couple other names in there that are people that would be in that early narrative. And so Adam and Eve, um, Satan, of course, Cain and Abel, they're not in the direct line or have anything to do with the seed promise that Seth is the person carrying that seed promise that God makes right at the fall. And he gives to Adam and Eve a promise of a seed and the seed of the woman that will crush the, the head of the serpent, Satan. And you can go back and read that. And I would recommend reading it across various versions to get a real um, depth of understanding of what's being said there. Um, it's also referred to as the Adamic covenant. I like the, the promise, the seed promise or original promise God made right away for a savior, for a Messiah that would come and crush the head of the serpent. Now, Adam and Eve thought that was going to happen right away. As we know today, God is still working that plan out through his son, Jesus. And in fact, the whole thing was fulfilled on the cross and through the resurrection. We're just waiting for that final, that final curtain to close, which we read a lot about in the book of Revelation. So without going there, that's the bookends for the Bible, Genesis, Revelation. And so understanding that God's promise will be curtain closed in the book of Revelation, you know, that's, that's where we're at. And how close we are to that end, I don't know. Each generation thinks it's their generation. Um, the way I look at culture today, I think, yeah, any minute, you know, any minute, God could close the curtain. So I don't know, we just have to always be ready. But again, I think that's why it's important to understand the big picture of the Bible and what God promised from way back here. And so the fall, and then we have the flood, and we see that the seed promise is carried down. And a lot of times we don't spend time on the names in the genealogies. But the major names, I think, are important. So during the flood, Noah is the one. He's the he's a great, 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 great grandson of Seth. But he's carrying that seed promise through the flood. And we get the Noachian covenant that God promises to continue that promise of a seed through Noah and into the new world after the flood. And there's also a rainbow promise that's that's with that as well. And then Noah has three sons, but Shem is the one carrying the seed promise 
forward and we get dispersion tower of babel after the flood where god confuses the languages and people begin to spread out and do what god had said be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth um, and so he kind of had to force that hand at the tower of babel and shem is still around when abraham's born shem is a great 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 um, grandparent of Abraham, but because again of those long lives, Shem is still alive. And so Abraham is born and God directly speaks to Abraham and gives him the Abrahamic covenant, which is, this is kind of where we are right now in our studies in Genesis, as we see the unveiling, the unfolding of that original seed promise and what it would mean through the person of Abraham. We don't have a nation of Israel yet, but it's going to come through the Abraham through Abraham's line. And we begin to see that in Isaac and Jacob, Isaac's son. Um, and then later on, Isaac, one of Isaac's 12 sons, Judah, is the one carrying that seed promise. And we see that continue on through the book of Genesis. And then we'll get into the Exodus, the book of Exodus later on, and we'll take a look at Moses. Now, Moses is not the seed carrier, but Moses has a very huge role. In the history of Israel, and we'll look at that when we get there, and we get a Mosaic covenant at that time. All right, so hopefully that chart will help you out a little bit as you're as you're practicing um, for these. Because I'm going to put those up each week, and so you're going to have to review that over and over. So maybe you took a picture of that. I'll put it on the website as well. And I want to go back to my PowerPoint. And so hopefully that'll help you with, again, with 2B and then memorizing versus the Great Commission. So this is a verse I'll have up for the next couple of weeks to work on. You might want to put these on little cards or something where you can see it on a regular basis and practice memorizing. Last week we had, for a few weeks, we had the Apologetics theme verse, the First Peter 3.15 verse. I think this one is, is just as important because Jesus tells us, and he says this at after his resurrection at the end of kind of of the gospel story where he's getting ready to ascend and he tells his disciples to therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them. I highlighted and bolded, uh, underlined, uh, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. I think that's a really important two verses um, to have as a memory, a memory verse in your back pocket, because what it does is it emphasizes what Jesus has asked us to do as his disciples. We, we need to go out and make other disciples and we need to teach them. We're all called to be teachers. You may not be a teacher that sits in a classroom, you know, of a bunch of students, um, but you might be a teacher in the sense that you're teaching your family, you're teaching your neighbors, you're teaching your friends um, in many different ways. It might just be in the way you live your life, the way that you share who you are as a Christian. Remember, we're representing God here. We're representing the name of Jesus as a Christian. And so we have to, I used to tell my, my teams that I coached, you have to take the fact that you're called to a little higher expectation of the way that you behave and the way that you um, live your life you know and my kids that were on that made my varsity teams in sports and I would tell them you know you made this team and you're again you're representing you know your school you're representing each other you're representing this team you're representing me as your coach you know so all of that goes together and I, I love using that as an example because I think if we look at Christianity in the same way, we're representing Jesus. He's our, our coach, you know, and he's the one we're representing. And we're not going to get kicked off the team. We're not going to lose our salvation. But do you want to be a starting player? Do you want to be a good representative of the team? Do you want to bring others out? Come on, try out for the team. Because we can all make the team. It's as Christians now, what do we do once we've made the team? We stop practicing. We start doing things that don't represent the team very well. You know, do we dishonor our coach and our school or, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, I like that comparison. So keep, keep, keep that in mind as we, as we use this verse as a memory verse. 
All right. So the other thing we do is that I want to do is be able to go back through um, go back through the questions from last week and just give some basic answers so that, you know, if there's anything you missed, you might want to jot it down, use it as, you know, kind of a study guide or even a leader's guide for, you know, if you do the study again, which I highly recommend you do, you know, repeating a study like this is really important. And maybe, you know, you're running your own in-home kind of study. And so I want to run through those, those questions from last week, Genesis 24 to 26, if you want to get out your questions. And I'm going to need to switch again my screen sharing. And hopefully, ah, that's not the one I want. Wait, give me a second. I'll learn this eventually. It's when I'm doing multiple screen shares that I'm having a little difficulty. There it is. Okay, good. All right. So Genesis chapters 24 to 26. So again, each week, I would encourage you to, at the end of class, before you do your new set of questions, anything you want to review about the class topic, the, um, you know, the apologetics piece or, or whatever that might be. And so going into then the Bible study. So at least you've discussed a little bit about it's going to be religious pluralism um, that we'll talk about tonight and then going into your new Bible study. So the questions from last week dealing with Genesis chapter 24 to 26, and we're getting to know Isaac now. We're kind of saying goodbye to Abraham and we're getting to know his son, Isaac. And so question two here in this chapter, <clears throat> excuse me, Isaac and Rebecca are married. So Isaac's older now. Last week, we talked about that story of him um, and Abraham's near sacrifice of him on Mount Moriah, which was a really, really important chapter that pictures Jesus in so many ways. Um, but now Isaac is older. And in this chapter, he's going to meet Rebecca and they're going to get married. So what are some things that happened in this story that show God was intervening to make Abraham's servant? successful why do you think it was important for isaac to get a wife from abraham's relatives and not from the local canaanites where they were living and then going a little deeper are there any parts of this story that might be a foreshadow of something greater and that's what i think is fun to see some of these foreshadow pictures so again i do the i copy the passage i read it through underline things that i think are important and then i go down and i summarize um some of the things I got out of that to answer those questions. Again, you can you can do this in a variety of ways, but I'm just like to share what I've done to help you out a little bit if you don't have a, a set way of doing it. So this passage itself is a standalone picture of a beautiful love story, one that was God ordained. All participants were willing, I think that's important to see, and trusting of what God's plan was, though not directly said, but implied. Each had a vital role to play in God's big picture and covenant promise moving forward. So again, if we're looking big picture, if we're thinking about what God's ultimate plan is in that seed promise and in an overall promise, um, we're, we're looking forward at a lot of stuff that pictures the Messiah and how God's plan plays out. So how God's sovereignty played out. Um, there might be some variations in the answers, of course, but I want to share the things I think are really important. God led the servant directly to Abraham's family. So you notice in the story that comes it, the first people he meets are like right connected to the family he was looking for. And even before he finished his prayer, Rebecca came out with a jar, with her jar, and she fulfilled all of the servant's requests in his prayer that he was praying. He, she was part of Abraham's family. Some scholars, and I just throw these things out, remember I said a lot of times it's not directly in the passage, but I like to share sometimes what I've read in commentaries and what scholars have said. Some scholars think she is exactly the one Abraham was thinking about since he had gotten news of his brother's growing family. So, you know, that's, you know, that's a kind of, oh, that's kind of cool possibility. Um, the other thing is God, and God had already knew what he was going to ask. And he was doing exactly what the servant had prayed for, watering the camels. That was no small task to offer. That took a lot of time and effort, yet she was willing to do that. She offered them a place to stay and willingly agreed to go with them and marry Isaac. 
all of this was like, how would you have any idea that this would actually be fulfilled? The, for the servant coming like from somewhere. I mean, there's no phones to call ahead and say, hey, you know, we're coming. It was just all God's sovereignty, you know, for him to run into them and and find them and, and all of these things happen exactly as they should have. So because of God's promise concerning the land, Abraham wanted Isaac to marry from his family and not the Canaanites. Let me pause again. <clears throat> this is way before the law where laws were given that you couldn't marry close relatives. And if we look at this scientifically and we go back to the original creation and how pure the DNA was and the fact that um, there wasn't a lot of corruption, the flood was not that long prior to this period of time. And it was very common for people to be marrying within family groups without any problems as far as DNA mutations and things that we we see today. And in fact, this is going to be a problem a little bit later on, and God will put it into the law of Moses is where you're going to get that. You cannot marry close relatives. So we want to make sure that's, that's you know, kind of stands out here. Um, again, this was a common and accepted practice in these days, and God had not forbidden it yet. The Canaanites, however, were pagans and would later become enemies of the nation of Israel. The Canaanites were also cursed from Noah's time. So if we remember the incident with Ham and exposing his father's nakedness to his brothers, Noah cursed Ham's son, Canaan. And, you know, this is kind of played out as we see throughout the history here going forward. Now, going deeper, some scholars teach the foreshadowing or typology as follows. And so within this story, we, see, we can see some, sometimes it's called typologies, pictures, foreshadowings of this whole this whole thing here Isaac and Rebecca's love story. So Isaac can be seen as a type of Christ, a type of Jesus who was an obedient son to the father and who eagerly and patiently waited for his bride. So as we know we're taught in the New Testament the church today is the bride of Christ, Eleazar, Abraham's servant and it's it's assumed it's Eleazar because this is the guy who was the number one in Abraham's family, the number one servant. It's the one he thought was going to actually have to be his son when God said, no, you will have Isaac. So this was a trusted servant. So it's assumed that it's Eleazar. And I'm going to say that the text doesn't say his name directly. But Abraham's servant, the servant here, can be seen as a type of the Holy Spirit who leads the bride to Christ as directed by the Father. It's an interesting picture. Rebecca can be seen as a type of the church, the bride of Christ who faithfully comes to Isaac and trusts that what God has done is in line with the purpose of her life. And so maybe there's some other pictures in the story, but these are the, this is kind of the three things that can really be um, pulled out or seen within the story as a foreshadowing or typology. All right, moving into, and again, if you have more to share that you might've got from that, please, please uh, put it in the comment section on the website. Chapter 25, question three, Abraham remarried after the death of Sarah. Who was Abraham's new wife? What do we know about the children they had? And why did Abraham differentiate between them and Isaac concerning the inheritance? So again, the passage there. And then um, I just listed Abraham's new wife's name was Keturah, and they had the following children. You know, so those six, six kids, six sons, it seems, um, and they may have had daughters. A lot of times daughters are not listed, but Midian is the one um, that I pulled out to talk about a little bit. And I went to BibleGateway.com because we hear later on um, quite often in future stories coming up, particularly in Exodus, Midian, the Midianites, it's a people group. And so it's the name of the country and the people uh, who comprised it from the forefather Midian. It'll be the Midianites. Um, and we'll see them later on. And in the biblical record, there's some places there you can see noted. The land of Midian played an important part in the life of Moses. This is a place Moses is going to flee to when he runs from the Pharaoh in Exodus, if you're familiar with the story. And he met and eventually was employed by Ruel or Jethro, a priest of Midian, who had seven daughters. One of those, Zephorah, became Moses' wife. It was while Moses was watching Jethro's flocks that he came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Um, it's also known as Mount Sinai. 
And again, Midian, um, there's a lot of different times we hear about Midians. There's a lot of different facets of, of the Midianites there that we'll talk about later on. The people of Midian, um, although the Midianites were described or were descendants of Abraham through his wife, Keturah, they never were considered part of the covenant people of God. And the hospitality of Jethro to Moses is commendable. But beyond that, the Midianites were a people hostile to, to uh, Israel later on. So they are going to be enemies. And it's just, <clears throat> it's interesting to note how it, Isaac really stands out from all these other children as the promised seed. And Abraham, he had to send away Ishmael earlier. We read, we read and talked about that last week because he was the oldest and poised the, and posed the greatest threat to Isaac's inheritance of the promised covenant. The other children were younger and therefore would not have a reason or way to fight against Isaac's birthright. Abraham further confirmed this in verses five and six when he said, or it says, now Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, but to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living and sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the land of the east. Um, you know, that sending away we talked about last week is a sign of saying, you know, you're cut off from, from me as far as any birthright or blessing or promise like that. So this would further confirm the land promise would be passed only to Isaac because Isaac was there. So sending away shows they're not part of that land promise either. <clears throat> All right. Question four. How old was Abraham when he died? Where was he buried and who was present at his burial? How old was Ishmael when he died and how many sons did he have? And going deeper, what are some things we know historically about the descendants of Ishmael and their relationship to Israel? So to help answer that question, there's a few things here. Abraham was 175 when he died. And Isaac and Ishmael both buried him in the cave of Machpelah, where, which he bought for Sarah. The saying is he was gathered to his people. Ishmael was 137 years old when he died. He had 12 sons who became 12 princes according to their tribes. And I would just note that if you've been following along in Genesis, we're noticing the longevity of life, the age of life is dropping, 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 dropping. And so, you know, Shem kind of was the last one that had that long, long lifespan. I think he was like 600 years. And then it really dropped significantly after that. We see Abraham at 175, which is in, in our terms still very old. But, you know, at that time, again, DNA being still fairly good and pure, um, people were still living longer, Ishmael a little bit less. And we'll see that drop even more as we go down the line to even Joseph at 110, Moses a little later at 120, which are all in the realms of our possibilities today, although still a difficult age to get to. Um, and they haven't changed much, you know, over the history of time at all. And so going deeper, history will report that the sons of Ishmael are the patriarchs of the Arab people. Notice that in verse 18, it says, they settled from Havilah to Shur, which is east of Egypt, as one goes to Assyria. And he settled in defiance of all his relatives. Back in 21, 16 to 21, God promised Hagar that he would take care of Ishmael and would make a great nation out of him. It is fulfilled here in this chapter. The Arab nation has been in conflict with Israel ever since. And we can still see it in the Middle East conflicts that we have today. And for more information on the re religion of Islam, you're going to have some class presentation notes a little bit later on um, in the next week or two that we'll do on kind of a Islam Christianity comparison. All right, question five. In the second half of this chapter, after 20 years, Isaac and Rebecca finally have children, twins, in fact. What happened between the children while they were still in the womb? And what did God tell Rebecca about the children before they were born? What were the boys' names and what do they mean? Discuss what happened between the boys when they were older and what is the significance for the future? I know I'm in trouble for questions within questions within questions. And I, I confess that's true, but I don't want you to miss anything here. So we'll break that down a little bit. Again, I underlined some things. And I think a really important thing to point out is verse 22. It tells us that the children struggled together within her, within Rebecca. So she went to inquire of the Lord. I think that's really important. Rebecca inquired of the Lord. 
And she asked the Lord, she asked Yahweh. This is big because she came from a pagan nation and did not know the one true God. But you could see, probably, most likely, I'm going to say, most likely, it doesn't tell us directly, but through the example of the servant, you know, probably uh, the servant we talked about earlier, Isaac and his father Abraham, she had learned the importance of asking the Lord, the Yahweh. She's going to learn from them. And, and, you know, you could see, again, the relationship Abraham and Isaac had with Yahweh. And it rubs off onto our families, I think. God told Rebecca, and so God spoke to Rebecca, and he said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples will be separated from your body, and one people shall be stronger than the other. And notice God tells her, the older shall serve the younger. So the note would be, Rebecca now knew that Jacob would be the one to carry the promise of the covenant, not Esau. Did she tell Isaac this? I, I would venture to guess she did. It kind of seems like Isaac didn't listen to her because Isaac favors Esau throughout the rest of the story, we'll see. Um, but Rebecca, is, in a sense, is being faithful. Now, we'll see her, like Sarah did, try to help God when they should have, she should have just, just as Sarah should have left things alone, but we'll see that in a little bit. Jacob, his name means heel catcher or supplanter, or figur figuratively, figuratively, it means he deceives. So that's interesting because we're going to see his name kind of play that out later on. Esau means hairy, and later he's known as Edom, which means red. And we'll see the Edomites, the nation that comes from Esau later on. So discussion, Esau seemed to live in the moment, giving no thought to what was important. He was so hungry that he agreed to sell his birthright to his brother Jacob for stew, regardless of the consequences to his agreement. So just some thoughts about Esau. You may have some other thoughts here as well. A birthright was a special honor given to the firstborn son. So you want to kind of look this up and see. It included a double portion of the family inheritance, along with the honor of one day becoming the family leader. The text says Esau despised his birthright, which means he had no regard for it at all. And consequently, the father's blessing, which would come later, he would lose that as well. We'll see in the later in the story. So he might have a few other thoughts on Esau at this point. We may have a few more later on as we move into their stories a little bit more. And then in question six in this chapter, Genesis chapter 26, we get a repeat of what Abraham and Sarah had previously done. So we get kind of a timeout here and we get a little side story and we see a repeat. Now, this is not the same Abimelech as before. It may have been a title or family name we had mentioned before, kind of like Pharaoh or something like that. It's possible. How is Isaac and Rebecca's story different in this case? And then going a little deeper, what did God say to Isaac in verses two to five and again in verses 23 and 24? Why is this important? So some differences from Abraham's encounter, God appears to Isaac and tells him to stay in that area and not to go to Egypt, down to Egypt, which you know, Abraham did. God establishes the covenant with Isaac at the same time. So what we're going to notice is that God specifically <clears throat> will come to, as he did Abraham, he comes to Isaac and makes a covenant establishment. He's going to do it again later with Jacob. And so we'll see this as, as going forward. The men of Gerar, the Philistines, did not take Rebecca. She stayed with Isaac, whereas with Abraham, you know, they took Sarah. Um, Abimelech saw them together. There was no plague put on his people. He just saw them like over a period of time. So it, that's the differences. But similarly, they lied to Abimelech the way Abraham did, saying they were siblings. They also were scolded by Abimelech in the same way, but allowed to stay in the land. Eventually, Abimelech sends him, Isaac, further away so as not to be near the people of Philistia as he grew too powerful. So going a little bit deeper, God is reinforcing the covenant promise with Isaac. And it's extremely important because this confirms that God was passing it on to and through Isaac, the seed promise. God does this twice, making it sure that Isaac knew he would be the one. And we will see this continue on through Jacob, Isaac's son, not Esau, the same as it wasn't Ishmael. So there's specific people God has selected 
And, you know, in hindsight, you can see it in the character. God knows hearts of people. God knows the end from the beginning. So he already knows what people are going to do and how they're going to do it and how they react to things. And so it, God never makes a mistake. I think it's really important to remember that. He never makes a mistake. And I have to tell myself that sometimes when I feel like things don't go the way I want them to, for sure. Last question. What happened between Isaac's men and the men of Gerar? At the end of the chapter, where it, what did Isaac do that made his parents unhappy and why? And then discuss how might Esau's decision-making ability reflect on his character and family in the future. And that's kind of going to the point I'm making about God knowing the hearts of these men and not selecting Esau, but he selected Jacob. So to help answer the questions, Isaac's men and the men of Gerar, Isaac's men opened up wells previously dug by Abraham's men, later filled up by the men of Gerar. So you could see a little back and forth jealousy here. And what's interesting is down the line, the Philistines are going to be another group of people that are going to be a thorn in the side of Israel. And so there's already a little bit of that going on right here. Isaac, he had so many flocks, herds, and servants that the Philistines envied him and the way God had blessed him. Abraham had also lived in the land of Gerar for many years, and his men must have dug many wells during that time. The scripture says they had been there and dug wells. Isaac is simply reclaiming old territories where his father once lived, but he is not just reclaiming old territories and old wells. He is also preparing new ones, helping fulfill God's covenant now through him. So this land covenant is expanding it. After quarreling over two wells on the third try, Isaac's men were able to keep that well. And this is where they settled. Notice they never fought. They just moved on until successful. So it's kind of an important, um, I think, application. We can see God's extreme blessing actually resulting in jealousy and conflict. And this continues throughout history with the nation of Israel, even today. A lot of people jealous. A lot of people don't understand the blessing of God upon that nation. And it's still today. We see it. Esau. Esau married two Hittite girls. Those are Canaanites. It's a, it's a, a Hittites. A, most of the ites in this area are under that umbrella, family umbrella of Canaanites. You could actually even go back and say Hamites. And this upsets his parents because they were pagans and not from their own clan or countrymen. So again, this goes back to the curse of Noah and Ham through his son Canaan. And again, it'll play out throughout the Old Testament. And so the line of Abraham, the seed promise line, is not to have any um, thing to do with the Canaanites for so many reasons and a lot going back to the curse. And again, God's foreknowledge of which he knows how bad these people groups will be particularly as we move forward. Now, answers will vary on Esau. <coughs> Excuse me. You know about his decision-making, but here's some things that it might you might have, you might want to add. Please, again, let me know if you want to add some things. Esau's poor decision-making ability is seen through this story, from selling his birthright to threatening to kill his brother to his bad choices in marriage all of his actions point to someone who is impulsive, self-centered, and reflects a person who does not think through the consequences of his actions, the results of which forever hurt his family, we'll see, including his own ability to lead, thus the reason for the loss of both birthright and blessing. None of Esau's decision-making ever included consulting God, as modeled by both his parents. So, I mean, I think those are just some important takeaways as to why we could see Esau was not the one to be, you know, carrying the seed promise. And so I'm going to stop at that point with the review. Again, if you want to um, add some things to those answers, please let me know uh, on the website in the comment section. And um, if you have, you know, any questions or concerns about things we've talked about, please. I, I love to dialogue, so you can uh, you can leave notes there as well. All right. So the second half to finish up a little bit on uh, apologetics for this evening. 
And I think it's really important um, to talk about this. And I'm, like I said, I'm going to break it up over the next few weeks. And we began last week talking about religious pluralism, because I think it goes along with what we're studying. And when we look at time and time again, God tells Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, later on, the people of, of Israel, the nation of Israel in general, not to combine or to syncretize with other, with the pagans, the other nations. And this was so many reasons for this, but mainly to keep the seed line pure, but to keep the nation, the people of God, the people God has chosen, to keep them as a pure people group that reflected who God was, again, being that role model for God, being on God's team, representing him, that was the nation of Israel's job. And the people right now that we're studying, Abraham, Isaac, and getting into the story of Jacob, as we will with this next set of Bible study questions. Um, so religious pluralism has been going on since this, since back at this day, where there were pagan nations doing worship and sacrifice and um, serving idols that were not the one true God, but were representative of, and I would, I would just put it out there, demonic things, demonic things. And, you know, particularly uh, associating things like worshiping the sun, the moon, the water, you know, the land, those are, and attributing them to particular gods. That's in, in my book is demonic is really what it comes down to. And God told them, don't do it. And we see that still today, even with Christianity, trying to, you know, syncretize or blend together Christianity with the views of other faiths, religions, philosophies, even ideologies that are out there. But what does the Bible teach? What does Jesus teach us as Christians? And I think that's what we have to always come back to is understanding what the word of God says. And so the, the all those symbols there basically, you know, saying that they all, religious pluralism basically says all of these will lead you to God and a happy afterlife. And that's just not logically true. And we went over a few reasons why fundamentally, foundationally, and salvationally, they can't all be true. They can't all be true at the same time. Um, I would show in class a little clip from the One Minute Apologist, but um, just to summarize what he says, and, and he's really good at, at giving you some quick answers to some some interesting and tough questions. So you can always look him up on YouTube, the One Minute Apologist, and all kinds of topics he covers. But basically, if we're looking at what religious pluralism is all about, it promotes tolerance of all religious beliefs as if they are equally true. Now, I, promoting tolerance is not a bad thing. I think we should all be tolerant of each other's views and differences, but not saying that they're all equally true when we come to truth. That's, that's the critical difference there. Um, religious pluralism lays claim to being politically correct because we don't want to offend anyone, even with the truth. Religious pluralism denies objective truth. And I think that's really a huge, huge red flag. Denies objective truth and promotes a type of relativism. You know, that, that whole thing where, you know, your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth, but we all are on the equal path to, to God. Um, your truth doesn't have to be my truth and all those, those kinds of things. Um, those are easily dismissed when you just ask somebody, is that true? Is what you're saying true? Well, I mean, if they're following their own philosophy, they have to say no. <laughs> so, you know, if they say yes, then they're claiming a truth claim. They're making a truth claim. And that gets a little tricky. But I think once you understand how to respond to them, when people make those claims, is what you're saying objectively true? They can't say yes, because they're just denying objective truth. So it puts them in a real conundrum there. So it's, it's something to, to kind of tease out a little bit. Again, gentleness and respect. Um, religious pluralism rejects the exclusive claims made by Jesus. They say Jesus is a great teacher, but he's one of many. 
when we look at religious pluralism. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said he made an exclusive claim. He said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So we'll take a look at that. Religious pluralism rejects the exclusive teachings of the Bible, same as the, the claims of Jesus. Religious pluralism falls under the banner of the religious institution known as universalism, so the universalist church, which everything goes, all things are, are true. And the, the biggest problem really is it opens up a smorgasbord approach to faith. Like, you know, I like some of Christianity, but not all. You know, I want that sacrifice thing. I'll take a little from Islam. I'll take a whole bunch from Hindu, Hinduism. And if I'm a good person, God can't possibly turn me away from heaven. And I think that's the hardest one to argue against, really, is because that's where most people are. They're just saying, I just want to be a good person. I'm just going to do the best I can. And when I get there, God can't, can't turn me away. And I think that's a problem because the problem is, is not knowing who God is. So when you get to that point and you take your last breath here, and the door opens on the other side, are you going to know the person opening that door? Whose house is it? Do you know Jesus? It's his house. It's his father's home. So, you know, we need to think about that. Um, so the question is, isn't Christianity an exclusive religion? So is it a, an exclusive religion? Does Is it exclusive, you know, like it's a club that only certain people can belong to? That's really not what Christianity is talking about. So I think it's important people, you know, say, you, you're so holier than now. You guys are exclusivists. You know, you have it, all the accusations that are there. But I think it's interesting if we really look at the definitions of these things. Exclusivism asserts that only one way is true and all the others are an error. Well, OK. That's true. But inclusivism asserts that while one set of beliefs is absolutely true, other sets of beliefs are at least partially true. Okay, we can go with that. Let's, let's just tease that out a little bit more. Here's the thing. When you go religious inclusivism is the belief that God is present in non-Christian religions to save adherents through Christ. It is God in Christ who reaches out to the individual in his own personal religious history to save him. Now, if that's if that's true... Then I would, I would argue that Jesus didn't really even need to be um, on the cross. You know, if he can just reach out through any religion, any faith, he didn't need to do what he needed to do. Because Christianity teaches a particular doctrine. And that doctrine points to Jesus being the one who had to go to the cross for us. He had to go to the cross for us. And this is what religious pluralism teaches is that in religious inclusivism, that, you know, Christ can still save you in any religion you want to be in, whether it be Hinduism, whether it be, you know, Islam or whatever. But the problem is when you are involved in, say, Islam, for example, they don't believe Jesus to be who he said he was and to have done what he did. They definitely don't believe he's the son of God or any form of a deity. So if you don't believe that within that particular faith, then how is Christ going to save you through that particular faith? See, this is where you get into a, a problem, I think. And even, and this is also a problem too, is that even belief in religious pluralism is an exclusive truth claim. They're saying religious pluralism is true. And so you get yourself in trouble there. If you just really start to like break down what is this actually saying and tease that out a little bit. Christianity, by definition, does make an exclusive claim to truth. It is an exclusive religion. So let's take a look at what, what, is that, what does that mean? If we are followers of Christ, then we must be followers of what he taught. Today, religious pluralism and political correctness has changed what Jesus said in John 14, 6 from, I am the way, the truth, and the life, to I am a way a truth, and a life. Change that. He's just one of many ways. The Bible is very clear on the teachings of Jesus, and there are many passages that support his exclusive claims. So Christianity, by, de by its definition, makes an exclusive claim to truth. But all other religions do as well. 
they all have exclusive truth claims. Even religious pluralism claims to be the truthful way. The Christian claim is exclusive, but the invitation is inclusive. I should say is inclusive. And that's the big difference here. Christianity is exclusive in its claims, but it's very inclusive in its invitation. And it's exclusive. It says, Jesus I, says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Everyone has the opportunity to do that, though. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. It's for everybody. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus. Let's look at a few more. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And for the grace of God, for the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people, everybody. So the difference again is the it is the claim that's exclusive, but not the invitation. The invitation is inclusive. Here's another one. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised up raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith and that not of yourself, <coughs> excuse me, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works so that no one may boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. <clears throat> so I think, you know, Christianity is unique in many ways. And it's really the, the uniqueness stands in Jesus because he, he did this. He did this. And so Christianity has to be exclusive because Jesus is the only one who claimed to be the son of God and proved it through his ministry miracles and resurrection jesus is the only one who fulfilled all the prophecies given hundreds of years before his time jesus is the only one who brought not just mercy forgiveness of debt but grace which is a gift of eternal life and jesus is the only one who said it is done so that we do not have to do anything to earn salvation and entrance into heaven christianity is inclusive <clears throat> because all are welcomed into the family of God through his son, Jesus. There is nothing a person can do to earn or work their way to eternal life. And there's some scripture references there as well. And Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. You know, that guy did not have time to get down and get baptized or come down off the cross and go do some good works, you know, help the old lady across the street kind of thing. He didn't have time for any of that. He just believed. He believed in Jesus and asked him, could I be with you in your kingdom? And Jesus said, today, you will be with me in paradise. That to me is very, very comforting, particularly, um, particularly for people who are not sure about loved ones who've passed. We don't know what happens in those final moments when people are in their deathbed. We don't know if they have that opportunity to talk to Jesus. Jesus knows. So we can take comfort in that. You have until that last breath. And, you know, don't ever think that it's too late until after they're gone. And we don't know even then what happened between them and Jesus in those final moments. And so I think we can take comfort in that. Some common arguments against Christianity's exclusive claims. <clears throat> and I think this is important just to, consider people in other religions are so sincere well they are devout sincere people there are devout sincere people of many faiths but people can be devoutly and sincerely wrong you know, people can be very sincere about what they believe but if they're wrong they're wrong sincerity is not a test for truth sincere faith in an improperly packed parachute won't matter we must be diligent in our preparation for eternity. So I think that's really important as well. We need to know, again, know what we believe and why we believe it. Christians are arrogant for claiming Jesus is the only way. You hear that? But arrogance is not a test for truth. 
The question should be, is it true? Is what I believe true? Arrogance is a description of an individual, not whether or not they have the truth. Again, I think that's why it's important to remember the gentleness and respect part of the first Peter verse. Truth is discovered and Christians are claiming to have investigated and discovered the truth by looking at the evidence. And finally, you might hear exclusive religious claims have led to war, violence, and oppression. <clears throat> and I find that interesting because there have been more wars in history over politics, ethnicity, and power than there have been over religion. Some people would use religion and claim it in those, those ways. True Christians, and this is the difference, true Christians do not lay claim to people in history that used Christianity for their own purposes, agendas, and ideologies. And I would say because Christianity does not teach those things like Islam does. Religion is not the fundamental problem. People are. Something is deeply wrong with the human heart, and that is the root of all the wars and oppression in history, human history. And Christianity has the best answer for the solution to that problem, the problem of evil and suffering. We've talked about that many a times in this class. Christianity has the best answer. Well, I think it's interesting just to notice that the genocide stats of the 20th century where more people were killed in wars than ever in history before. And we see <clears throat> the rape of Nanking, <clears throat> excuse me, 300,000 deaths, Rwanda, 800,000 deaths, Armenians in Turkey, um, 1.5 million deaths, Pol Pot in Cambodia, 2 million deaths, the Nazi Holocaust, 6 million, Stalin's force, fam famine, um, 7 million people died in that. All of these wars and deaths were caused by non-Christian dictators, atheist philosophies and ideologies. So just to conclude what we're talking about here on religious pluralism, um, how can we know if Christianity's exclusive claims are true? Well, the test is called the correspondence theory of truth. And really it's just asking a simple question, does it line up with reality? Is it true? And we see that with the Bible over and over again. We see that with Christianity over and over again. And we can test its histor historical accuracy, textual criticism, and eyewitness accounts via our maps. And we've covered this, you know, in, in many times in the class, the manuscript evidence, the archaeology evidence, the prophecy fulfillment, the authenticity of the science, and the saved lives over time. This is our maps, and we've covered so much of this, and we can have so much confidence in the fact that Christianity's claims are based on the word of God, and over and over again, we find truth in and about the word of God. And so the evidence cuts the choice for objective truth down to only one, and that's Christianity. That is Christianity. Next week, I'm going to start with just reviewing a little bit, and we'll look at a we'll look at a slide that kind of does a little comparison. I'm just going to flip through it real quick. There, we're going to do a little comparison. I'll go over that that chart with you next week um, on the various you know world religions and ideologies and how they compare on some of the most important questions asked in this life. And so we'll pick up there next week. Um, I'm going to leave you with your Bible study questions for this week. We're looking at Genesis chapters. 27 through 29, and we're looking at the beginning of, you know, the life of Jacob out, you know, kind of getting out on his own and, um, you know, what happens uh, in that little deception that him and his mom, you know, pull on his father. And so go ahead and work on those questions with your group. And I'm going to leave you with that. Again, if you have any questions or comments, please go to the website and put them there and I'll be happy to get back to you. Otherwise, have a blessed week and we'll see you all back again next week. Bye-bye.